He touched me. Oh, he touched me. And now there's joy that floods my soul. Hi, dear friends. Pastor Dan here. Now, if you're joining us for the first time, I want to welcome you as we gather together once again around God's holy and infallible word that I always say because I truly believe is the only word of absolute truth going out into the former United States of America from the very top to the bottom and for that matter any other country. Now dear friends if you're blessed uplifted challenged in any way by our study today then I would encourage you to subscribe or ring the bell as they say uh, because that way you can always check and see when we're having a new study and for that matter you can always also check back to some of our former studies because they do go back a, a few years now. Now, while you're there, why not share? Invite a, a friend, a family member, maybe even a former friend because you just don't know because you dared enough to reach out with the love of God a former friendship just might be rekindled around the Word of God. Now today in our study, we're going to continue following Jesus to the conclusion of chapter 15. So as you know, we're prone to go word by word, verse by verse. So as I put on my other pair of eyes so I can make sure I'm saying the same thing that God wants to say, I encourage you to get your Bibles and open them to chapter 15 of John. And today our, well, our text verse will be at chapter 12. But in the way of review, in our last study, we followed Jesus through the first 11 verses of chapter 15. Now, and one of the standout verses was verse 3. Because there we learned the importance of, and power of the Word. The Word of God has cleansing power, and that's seen through the sanctification of a fruit-bearing life. Jesus said, You are already clean through the Word that I have spoken to you. For the truly repentant heart is through the Holy Spirit that the Father in Christ cleanses us. And He does so by the washing of the Word. And through the washing we become fruit bearers, both in our character and our outreach. We noted in that, uh, that last study that through sanctification, this fruit becomes more and more evident in our lives. It's noticed and it's clearly seen as part and, and different from the life of the non-believer. It's seen in the love, in the joy, in the peace, the kindness. It's seen in the goodness and the faithfulness, the, the, the gentleness, and yes, even self-control manifested in your life. It's important that we notice that Jesus did not say that it was through church doctrine or uh, membership in a church, but through the word that he has spoken to you, and he still speaks through his word. The question that you need to consider is how often do you hear from him? And is it enough that his word is guiding your life? Perhaps one of the more, most influential verses was verse 9. It's, it's rather short, very powerful, and still not always understood, which is why the Lord had me share with you the importance of that word loved in the opening line of verse 9. It's important because the word is past tense, but that is in no way saying that it implies that, that it's all over, manifested and ended right there on the cross. In reality, we found in our last study just how far reaching that word loved is. Its length and its depth is realized in Ephesians 1, 4, where we see that God chose us, and that's you, dear ones. God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, his love. So how far back does his love for you reach before the foundation of the world or universe? How far forward does it go? All the way to the throne room of God where we will stand before him without blame, covered by his love. Lastly, we've seen that when it comes to, to having joy in your life, those who look outside of saving grace, they're, they're constantly in need of a new fix, or you could say a, a new high. But if we stay in God's word, and his word abides in us, then his joy remains in us. And when that happens, we find our joy is complete. It is as Jesus said in verse 11, these things I have spoken to you, that my joy my joy may remain in you and your joy may be full or or complete nothing lacking 
Christ's joy, joy remains forever. It is forever ingrained in his love. It is his to impart, and once given, dear ones, he never takes it back. His joy is spiritual. His joy brings peace with God and consequently peace with self. It is as we're told in Nehemiah 8.10, Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. It's a, it's a text that has come to me a great deal more to me since the passing last month of my dear wife. And that brings us to verse 12, our text for today, where Jesus says, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Now that sounds harsh, maybe maybe even impossible. It, it's as if he's saying, I command you to love that person, a person you might not, may not even like. In and of itself, the commandment would be no different than the other ten, impossible to fulfill. However, the good news is that Jesus never has given us a command without giving us the, the ability to fulfill it. And you find that ability back in verse 9, where Jesus said, As the Father has loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. It would be impossible. It would be ridiculous and even prideful to think that you could abide in his love if his love were not in you to abide in. Human love, dear ones, cannot fulfill the command of verse 12. It's not capable of it. And that's why Jesus did not say we should phileo, the Greek for human love, phileo one another. He uses the word akapeo, which comes from agape, godly love, which is as Jesus loves us, which is as God loves Jesus. This is Christian love. And whether expressed toward fellow Christians or people in general, it is not an impulse that's, that's inspired by feelings. It's not always run, run with natural inclinations, nor does it spend itself only upon those for whom some affinity is discovered. The love that Christ enables us to have seeks the welfare of all. It works no ill to anyone. As 1 Corinthians 13 tells you, it seeks to do good to all, and especially to the household of God. You need to know that, that the love of Jesus for his disciples, and hopefully that includes you today, it, it's a precious thing. For it's, like the, it's exactly like the love of the Father for the Son, thus giving us all the more reason that we should exert ourselves to abide in it. As to the last phrase in verse 12, as I have loved you, it can only be realized as expressed in verse 9, as the Father has loved me. As the Father has loved Jesus, so Jesus has loved you in exactly the same way. And he goes on to say in verse 13, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. While it is, while it's, it, it is our pattern, it should be understood that that the love of Christ cannot, in every sense of the word, be patterned or copied. As far as its infinite value, its substitutionary character, and its glorious redemptive consequence is concerned, his act of love, whereby he, he determined to lay down his life for us, can truly never be a pattern for our love for one another. In these respects, his love is completely unique. It cannot be copied. However, in terms of being self-sacrificing in nature, then through his love we are capable of copying. Basically, Jesus is saying in your love for one another, you must be willing to deny yourself. Pick up your cross and deny yourself as he did. But when it comes to laying down the purity of his life for the corruption of ours, only Jesus could do that. Only he has that kind of love. He goes on to say in verse 14, You are my friends, if you do whatever I command you. So once again, that big word is if. For it lays the responsibility on us. If you, if you would count yourself a friend of Christ, you must do his bidding, primarily to love one another. Intimacy with him is the motive of loving as he loves. If we obey his command to love, then we enjoy the intimacy of his friendship. You need to understand that friendship, listen, friendship, unlike sonship, is not a once-for-all gift. It develops as a result of obeying Jesus' command to love. And he goes on to say in verse 15, No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. 
but I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my Father, I have made known to you. So until this point, we see from chapter 12 and chapter 13 that Jesus had called his disciples servants. A servant does what he is told, sees what his master does, but does not necessarily know the meaning or the purpose of it. On the other hand, a friend knows what is happening because friends develop deep fellowship by communicating with one another. Clearly implied in these words of Jesus is the thought that he is not satisfied with merely servile obedience. His friends, and that should include you, are motivated by friendship when they do his bidding. Obedience, then, is an expression of our love. He says in verse 16, You did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. Jesus had initiated the relationship with his disciples. In every case, he bid them, follow me. It, it started with servanthood, but it grew to friendship. Having chosen the disciples, Jesus ordained them to bring forth permanent fruit. And that commission rests with you today. If you abide in his love and his word abides in you, spiritual and lasting fruit will be produced in your life. Your part is obedience. His is producing. It is an intimate relationship. And out of this friendship and lasting fruit comes answered prayer. A true disciple prays for fruit. For this fruit of the Spirit is pleasing to God in the lives of his children. Being a true disciple and in accord with the Father through Christ, he or she asks God to give whatever is in accordance with his will. As Scripture tells us, we have this confidence when we come to God that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. But this is not asked out of any sense of self-merit but solely on the basis of Christ's merit and in complete harmony with his revelation, hence in Christ's name. And he goes on to say, these things I command you, that you love one another. This, this verse may sound pretty much like verse 12. However, it differs in that it, it serves as a, as a summing up of all that precedes, hence you have the opening phrase, these things. Loving one another, then, is the mark of Christian discipleship. And while we are called to love, there is much in this world and much of it toward Christians and Jews alike, hatred. And much of that in the name of some God that I, for lack of a better name, would classify as Lucifer. These early disciples would go through the same hatred that Christ went through and most would now end up as martyrs for him. He Jesus goes on to say in verse 18, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Now here again is that two-letter word, if, but here it forms no question. The Greek intent is an absolute. This would happen, and it is happening. The fact that the world hated Jesus, and this hatred has been present almost from the beginning of his public ministry and had never subsided is evident in the fact that he was speaking, as he was speaking to his disciples, the Pharisees, were planning to kill him in the name of religion. But stepping aside from the scene John is portraying, it should be understood that, that already in the lives of his readers, persecution was a rampant reality. The Christian community had already been excluded from the synagogues and had suffered martyrdom throughout the Roman Empire. So for the initial readers of John's Gospel, verse 18 struck a kind of a, a painful chord of realism and also served as a reminder that their resurrected Lord had also walked in the way of being hated. The phrase, before it hated you, is important. Through this, the disciples were informed of what was to come. But hearing about it and experiencing persecution are not the same. Jesus knew that hatred was as it is the mark of the world, just as love was to be the mark of the authentic, truly born-again Christian. And you and I can offer no other response. Verse 19, Jesus goes on to say, If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, 
therefore the world hates you. Now, the casual reader won't notice, but as a person of the word, you should see that while the word if in verse 18 states a fact, here in verse 19 it introduces a supposition that the disciples do not belong to the world. And neither do you, dear ones, if you are a repented, born-again believer in Jesus Christ. If they had belonged to the world, the world, had, the world would have accepted them. The world loves its own. It loves its own corruption and despises any reminder of that condition. And so we see Jesus saying in verse 20, Remember the word that I said to you, A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. So the opening clause reflects and, of course, is a reminder of what Jesus told them in verse 13. The point is, Jesus is here telling his disciples, as he tells you and me today, you can expect to be treated like he was, because those who hated him then did not know God any more than they do today. And consequently, they will hate you. Conversely, those who listen with faith to him will hear you also, for his word abides in you, and that is what you speak. Just as Jesus told his disciples in verse 20, as a true born-again disciple of Christ, you should be reminded that according to 2 Timothy 3.12, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. He goes on to say in verse 21, but all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. Now that word but in, but all these things serves to bring our attention to the fact that the world does not follow the way of obedience. And it will be, it will be because you dare to proclaim the name of Christ before this guilt that the world will and does hate you. Make no mistake, the day is coming, now is, that even here in America, you will have to choose. Listen, you will have to choose between us being accepted by the world or accepted by God. And conversely, rejected by the world or rejected by God. Jesus goes on to say in verse 22, If I had not come and spoken to them, they would have no sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. This is not to say that if Jesus had not come, they would have been sinless. But his coming incited the severest and the deadliest sin, that of rejecting and rebelling against God and his truth. It was, it was this decisive sin of rejection, the deliberate and final choice of darkness over light and death over life of which Jesus spoke. He had in three years done many miracles. He had spoken innumerable words to prove he was the Messiah, the Son of God. But the people, under the influence of the religious leaders, were belligerent in their love of sin and rejection of the Savior. And that's just the way it is. He says in verse 23, He who hates me hates my Father also. Jesus said, He who has seen me has seen the Father. Consequently, a person may imagine that he or she uh, loves the Father while they hate the Son, but such a person is gravely deceived. Whoever hates the one necessarily hates the other also. Those who scoff at blood atonement, reject the vicarious death of Christ, do not, cannot love God. And so Jesus says in verse 24, If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they have seen and also hated me and my Father. In verse 22, Jesus spoke about his words. Now he adds the works of signs that supported his word. And that, that last clause, they hated me and my father, reflects strong truth because both his words and the signs that Jesus did were the father's. And by means of both, the father was revealed and rejected. And so Jesus said in verse 25, but this happened that the word might be fulfilled, which is written in the law. They hated me without a cause. Now the opening phrase reflects all that Jesus said about the world's rejection of him, including that hatred leading to his crucifixion. The use of the word law, and written in the law, has a general meaning of Torah, 
but not merely just as a set of rules and regulations. And not only necessarily the first five books of the Old Testament, but as scripture as a whole, which spells out the way one must walk in the will of God. In verse 25, Jesus quoted from Psalms 35 and Psalm 69, verse 4. So the logic here is that if David, a mere man, could have been hated in such a terrible manner by the enemies of God, how much more would the wicked hate David's perfect divine son, who was, as 2 Samuel 7.16 tells us, the promised king who would confront sin and reign forever over his kingdom of righteousness. Jesus went on to say in verse 26, But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. Now, at this point, Jesus returns to the Holy Spirit, as mentioned back in, in chapter 14. The clause, whom I shall send to you, is future tense, because Pentecost had not yet arrived. So it seems obvious that after all Jesus had said to them about the hatred they would endure, that he would return to that which, that which brings comfort, that being the person of the Holy Spirit. So in the midst of the wicked world, the Holy Spirit would, as he, as he still does, testify against it. He bears witness concerning mankind's need. And whatever, whenever a true believer of God bears witness against the world, this witness is the work of the Holy Spirit. And whenever a simple believer, by word and example, draws others to Christ, this too is the work of the Holy Spirit. And for that work to continue, Jesus goes on to say in our last verse for today, and in fact for this chapter, and you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. So not only would the Holy Spirit bear witness, but through him you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. Essentially all the hatred the disciples would endure would be because of their witness. And for that witness to be effective, it must be endued with the very same power that Jesus was. And so we see after his resurrection and before his ascension that Jesus said to these same disciples in Acts 1.8, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And that's where it all begins. That's where it begins in your life. You too, as a repentant believer, have been endued with power from on high. The power and the person of the Holy Spirit. But be well warned. We are told not to quench the Holy Spirit. To do so is to quench His witness. So if you see that you're not quite allowing Him to do His work through you, then stir up that gift that is in you and open your mouth and let Him speak. And then always remember, whenever that witness is rejected, it's His witness they reject, not yours. So if you're still a willing vessel, I would say, Trust him. Let him use you to witness of the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for, for John's insight. We thank you for all he shares, knowing that it is through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that he shares all these, these insights. And we know, dear Father, we don't have to look very far to see the hatred that, that he's referring to. But we don't have to look any further than inside of us. We're so willing to see the love that he refers to. So dear one, if you have joined us today and you don't have that love inside you, you don't have this Jesus that we've been talking about inside you, that you would like to. You'd like to surrender your life to him. It, it all starts with repentance. What is repentance but believing what God has said about you and me? Believing and agreeing that we are sinners. I'm a sinner. Now I want to be a sinner saved by grace. A repentant heart. One that asks, asks him to come into you. Be your Lord. To be your Savior. 
And dear friend, if, if that was you today, then I would encourage you to know that Jesus has made a promise to you. This is a promise that will be yours for a lifetime, if that was your prayer. And you can see it for yourself in Revelation 3.20, where Jesus says, Behold, or literally, listen, I stand at the door and knock. And from a spiritual perspective, that's, that's the door of your heart. And he says, if anyone hears my voice and opens that door as I pray you have, well, that you will, here comes the promise. Then I will come into him, dine with him, and he with me. His indwelling to you, dear ones, is by your invitation. It's by you opening that door, inviting him in. And when that happens, then it is the beginning of an ever-increasing fellowship that just that just grows stronger and sweeter as the days and even I'm here to tell you even as the years go by and you engage yourself in the fellowship of prayer and and in God's word and yes in the community of a Bible teaching church that stands by the apostles doctrine and fellowship the breaking of bread and of course prayer now friends I hope that you'll join with us in our next study as we uh, once again gather around God's word and continue following Jesus right on into chapter 16 of John but unto the dear ones may the Lord bless you and keep you may the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you may the Lord grant you his favor and give you his peace until next time as I always say I believe Father God has something special for us but until then, God bless and bye-bye.